Rambling. I'm Alex Kak, and our guest today is writer Jacopo Della Cuerta. Uh, Jacopo, thank you for joining us. Thank you for having me. It's a pleasure to be here. Um, so uh, it took us a, a bit of technical difficulty to get here. <laughs> Sorry about that. Uh, you know, first question uh, right off the bat uh, is just how are you? How are you holding up? Uh, these are kind of weird times we're living in. So I just like to check in on everybody. Uh. I mentioned this right before our talk. I very embarrassingly had a bit of a head start on this whole stay at home thing. I slipped on some ice right outside of my house and some of my Twitter followers unfortunately saw I have I had an enormous bruise on my thigh for about three weeks. So before all this happened, I was already staying at home and they had to do x-rays to see if it was broken. And fortunately, the last time I was in a hospital was just a few days before the stay at home was issued. So thank God I do not have to go to any hospitals or anything for that. No bones were broken. But uh, that said, when it comes to adjusting, I mean, I am very, I'm very fortunate to be living in, t in a part of New York state, which is very sparsely populated. Uh, we've only had about two dozen confirmed cases of COVID-19 in the entire county. And um, my fiance and I, she's a teacher, I'm an educator and a writer. We were able to somewhat pretty effortlessly transition our careers back at home. It took a lot longer, of course. Um, I mean, when it comes to her, teachers are all working 24 seven right now. A lot of people don't know that teachers, their job starts when they wake up now, their job ends when they go to sleep because there's so much additional planning and paperwork that goes into what they're doing that is not being reflected in any way in pay or anything like that. So we're adjusting. We really don't have any complaints. The last time we were outdoors, oh, I'm sorry, the last time we were in uh, the outside world, let's say, was just a few days ago to do some last minute shopping. We have everything that we have to last until the fall, maybe. So we're in good shape. And as is our families. Uh, I'm, I'm very grateful to hear that. Um, it is, it is, it is the, it, you know, recording these episodes in the last two weeks, it throws a weird cloud over the conversations. And it's it's almost impossible to avoid, even when it, we try to, like, focus in on people's work or their lives. I mean, this is impacting everything right now. Um, now, you, I mean, you, you are a writer. Uh, so uh, you probably had an easier transition with this than some others. Uh, let's... Talk about what your life, though, uh, in a professional sense, was like before this. I mean, did you were you already working from home primarily? Do you have an office space that you tend to go to? Well, before I answer that question, I just want to thank you for having this podcast because the fact that people are still doing their passions, their careers, whatever, as long as people are still creating, there's a hint of normal right now. So I very much appreciate what you are offering, and I do want to make it very clear that. Um, the transition as a writer, uh, even though I am much more used to working at home, to answer your question, I've done almost all my writing at home. I have i don't think I've ever professionally had to relocate for any of my writing ever. But um, the thing, though, is the rest of my industry isn't used to that. I write for Reader's Digest. They're working at home now, which is um, a transition for them. I've been helping them as much as I could. I was working on a piece right before the stay at home was issued. And I mean, I had, um, I was in talks with writing what I was hoping to be my next novel right before all this happened. And I unfortunately haven't heard from my publishers since then. There's been, um, for everyone, the entire career, I've been speaking to very successful friends, high, high ranking friends of mine, agents about just the state of the publishing industry right now. And uh, they basically said that because so many of the bookstores are shuttered right now, they don't really know what's going to be happening in terms of book deals, film deals, almost anything in entertainment. It is chugging along right now. We've seen major studios, say, delaying their films. But um, for writers in general, a very, uh, very talented writer that I recently reviewed one of his books, he got a starred review in Kirkus, which is a dream for any writer. I've never received that. And unfortunately, his book was supposed to be debuting amidst, I think it was one week ago, his book was supposed to debut. So this is very difficult for almost every facet of the writing industry 
that I've at least been in contact with. I know some people are more fortunate than others. Some people are less fortunate than others. And of course, there are some people who are doing this while having, um, while being high risk when it comes to exposure to COVID-19. Fortunately, I am not vulnerable to that. Unfortunately, my fiance is. So those are the kind of things on my mind when it comes to COVID-19. And uh, as a writer working from home, it's like I said, I am very familiar with working from home, but the rest of the world that I'm currently working with is not as familiar. So it is affecting both sides as a result. I mean, yeah, this is a, I mean, it it is affecting the whole world. And I think especially with creative pursuits and writing specifically, you know, there is this kind of online narrative that started to grow about, uh, oh, well, this is a horrible tragedy, but the art that'll come from it, you know, Shakespeare wrote in quarantine, yada, yada, yada. Uh, I, I don't necessarily know that that's, that's helpful or healthy. Um, you know, that people forget there is a lot of mental, uh, toil and anguish. I think that that is impacting people right now. And I think placing these additional expectations can be kind of, you know, at best disingenuous to the creative process, but possibly harmful to the industry overall. I mean, have you, encountered any of that uh in your correspondence online uh and if so how has that impacted the way you view your work well i mean as i mentioned um a very talented writer i had recently read his book and um he was without a doubt impacted as a result of this his book was supposed to debut uh several weeks ago and every bookstore in the country is well not everyone but many of them where he was in philadelphia are closed right now So that's without a doubt affecting him negatively, which is a shame because this is his debut novel. You only get one debut novel, and this is his experience. Um, In my own case, when it comes to, um, I I mean, I will say, historically, we do know certainties. We do know that uh, Boccaccio, during the Black Death, he wrote um, The Decameron, which is, I call it the Pulp Fiction of the Renaissance. It was um, a 14th century text that had about 100 short stories in it, similar to The Thousand and One Nights. And uh, the book itself was meant to be an escape for the audience and also for the characters in the book, an escape from their experiences over in Florence when it came to the Black Death. Uh, The first Renaissance man, Petraca, he wrote his poetry during the Black Death. In fact, his muse, a woman named Lara, she died from bubonic plague. So... That, without a doubt, affected his writing. Of course, William Shakespeare, as I've actually mentioned in License to Quill, he lived through numerous plague years. He survived. He was born during a plague year. He lost his son, Hamnet, to bubonic plague. And um, similarly, um, I believe even, uh, I believe one of his his, uh, greatest actors also died during one of the pandemics in the very early 17th century. So we do know at least in the English-speaking world and the Italian-speaking world, some of the greatest works in history were written during plague years. At the same time, the plague is indiscriminate. Writers have died during the Black Death. Um, Artists were affected by influenza. And uh, and another thing is that you have uh, students, first-time people, people who otherwise would be making connections, people who otherwise would be reading this one book or being exposed to this one uh, essentially, um, this one uh, beginning of further research, all their lives have been affected. Every one of us have equally been affected. Uh, I'm particularly uh, concerned when it comes to students, graduate students, undergraduates, and individual students when it comes to how their development as artists are being affected by this. But what I can say is that what we're going through right now is an opportunity for us to create something. Even if even if we're just writing something which is a complete distraction for what's going on. Like I, I, I wanna see the children's books that are written during this time period. I wanna read the comedy that's written during this time period. I know that, um, uh, what is it, love in the time of cholera has sort of become like a meme right now about the first great work to be written about this right now. But I mean, I'm genuinely curious to see what are sitcoms going to be like as a result of this? What are movies going to be like? Is the MCU going to be addressing this? Or are we sort of living through the equivalent 
of the snap in the MCU. I mean, this is something which is so cataclysmic in terms of the world right now that we should be expecting this to influence art as much as 9-11 did, if not more so. I would probably say more so. But uh, I am rambling right now, so I do apologize. I do that quite a lot. Interrupt me at any time. I think that was a very whole po- roundabout way of saying uh, maybe. Rambling is the whole point of the show. Uh, it's literally in the title. Um, so you're, you're very right on way. brand. Exactly. Yeah. You know, uh, you were touching on something there, uh, which I think is just the the nature of creativity uh, and and artistic creation uh, to to humanity and, and how central it is to the human experience. I mean, how much weight and value do you put on that? How, how, what, uh, how important is not just your own creativity, but the creativity of humanity to you? Uh, I really look at it this way. I really feel that the human mind is not too different than it was 2000 years ago. We have access to more things. Uh, we have, you know, more women in academia than, well, actually, we actually have women in academia as opposed to 2000 years ago. And I feel that, you know, there's um, a lot more opportunity to share our work more rapidly into wider audiences. But I mean, I still feel that the relationship between the arts and the sciences is integral. I mean, there's a reason why so many of the great scientists in antiquity were philosophers. There's a reason why uh, Descartes, one of the greatest mathematicians in history, was a philosopher. I mean, the marriage that we've always seen between the arts and the sciences, in my opinion, fuels creativity. I mean, Einstein played the violin um, when it came to, um, uh, you know, his own, I mean, his own universality. And when it comes to Leonardo da Vinci, Leonardo da Vinci was an engineer and a painter and a musician. He was many of those things. So I really feel that um, if one thing does come out of this, which I would like to see more of, it is more of an appreciation for the arts and the sciences together. I I taught a class at Albany Medical College one time. It was just a several week lecture on narrative medicine, which is this one field of medicine um, really cornered in uh, Columbia Medical School. And narrative medicine is all about essentially increasing the dialogue between doctors, doctors and their patients, doctors and other doctors, and doctors in their community. So that um, those that are in um, medical care are able to better understand who they are, who they've come from, what doctors and what uh, medicine has been throughout history. And if there's any artistic outlet that could be used for them, uh, how it could in some cases help their work um, reach a a wider audience. Like they've been finding that uh, quite a few medical papers are more likely to be shared and even quoted and cited if they're written as a narrative rather than simple, very, you know, more stoic facts or reports like that. And I believe the reason why is because humans are natural storytellers. I believe that's, that's probably the beginning of, in my opinion, great discourse, great discourse, like great discussion among people probably began with storytelling, just one person saying something that did or did not happen. And with what we're going through right now, there is one thing, though, which um, I don't really view this as a universal boon when it comes to what we're experiencing. As I mentioned before, so many famous works were written amid crises, amid quarantine, amid war, amid famine, etc. Well, they didn't have the internet back then. So as a result, who knows, the next Don Quixote might be drowned out simply because there's a video of a cat wearing a cowboy hat that people really liked. And one thing I've told one, th- one thing I've told students is everything that you write is competing with every book that's ever been written. It's competing with every film that's ever been made. Anything you write right now is competing against all the pornography on the internet. Think about that. That's tough. You have to convince people to essentially ignore the chaos of every other thing they could be turning to for entertainment in order to appreciate your work. And when you have several billion people doing this at the same time, one, I'm amazed the internet hasn't crashed from the weight of all this right now, which I believe would probably be, uh, let me just say I'm glad that hasn't happened. But um, I really do hope that um, when it comes to the fine arts, when it comes to anything, when it comes to 
dance, when it comes to painting, when it comes to any of those creative outlets, poetry, I really hope that as long as people are sharing more of it and more confident and more appreciative of the humanities in general, I really feel that could be one of the, hopefully, one of the good lessons that we could take from all this, the importance of humanities during a time where we're so dependent on the sciences. Right now, it's the humanities that are helping us through this. It's the books that have been written. It's the artwork that we're creating. It, it is that aspect of humanity, which I feel has essentially been a little bit divorced in recent times, and in my opinion, very divorced from scientific appreciation, that I very much hope we can have more appreciation for and more exchanging of during this time period and hopefully afterwards. I, mean, I, I couldn't agree more. And I think you were really touching on something important and that I've, I've for many years thought was important and the relationship between the sciences and the arts. Um, I, I, I'm a firm believer that there, there truly is no discovery without imagination. And the arts push our collective imagination forward uh, more than anything. They, they may be the product of our collective imagination. I want to dig into the specifics of your work and your art, though. Uh, you mentioned earlier that you were you're waiting to hear back about your next novel. Uh, is there any chance we could get you to talk about it at all? I would love to. Um, I don't know how much I can talk about it. What I can say is that uh, all of my um, all my works are somehow shared together. Uh, my very first novel, The Great Abraham Lincoln Pocket Watch Conspiracy, which is this uh, framed uh, poster right over here. My fiance for Christmas one year, she framed uh, both of my novels. So that, that's very nice. Uh, for that first book, I did toy. And there's one conversation in that book, which is it's a steampunk-esque uh, science fiction. It's basically a modern day. It's a Jules Verne adventure where the exotic location is the United States 100 years ago. I tried to think if Jules Verne was alive today and he was writing adventures set in the United States, what would it be like? And that was that book, The Great Abraham Lincoln Pocket Watch Conspiracy. And it's follow up right over here, License to Quill. I've always viewed those books as part of the same universe because they're historical fictions. History is my playground for those books. And when it came to my most recent book, Mac Trump, which I co-wrote with uh, Ian Desher, the uh, author of the, the best-selling uh, William Shakespeare Star Wars series. That was a wonderful experience. I loved working with him. One of my, I don't want to say a character, a prop in this book over here has a cameo appearance in there. There's a liquor cabinet in Mac Trump, which is the scene of a surprise, and they call it a surprise. And that is actually the surprise liquor cabinet from the Pocket Watch Conspiracy, which is called the surprise... Mm -hmm. Um, it's called the Surprise Cabinet because it's made out of timbers from the HMS Surprise, which was a, a famous ship in the, in the uh, early 19th century. So I've always viewed them as together. I will say, though, that the next, the most recent work I was uh, writing during this time, like I wrote a sample chapter for review. It was a sample chapter for what I hope to be a follow-up to the Pocket Watch Conspiracy that was answering a concern that the characters in that book brought up. There was one scene where they were discussing about how weird, what, what an unusual week they've been going through. How in the course of one week, President Taft was nearly killed. Um, there was um, an attempt on Nikola Tesla's life. There was a lot of very strange stuff happening during this one week. And the characters are actually musing, is it possible that history has been changed? Because of what's going on. And I had always written that in the book, expecting to be revisiting that in a future text. And if I do get to write this, and I want to keep in mind, I'm actually writing several works right now. That was just one of the most recent ones. If um, that is published, we will in fact see why that one character suspected that history had just been changed. Because um, in my mind, history had been changed. I was changing it as an author, interacting with it. And I believe that uh, the past and the present of that story have changed. And I will go into a little bit more detail in a future work, hopefully. I, I think we're all excited to, to see it. Um, Thank you. You know, speaking about just kind of your career overall, because uh, you, as you mentioned, you're a writer for Reader's Digest. Um, you've had a long career as a writer. Um, you now have published novels. But how did this begin? 
Uh, how did this begin? And then what were the steps through your career? I mean, take us on that kind of narrative journey of how you became a writer. My uh, writing always began as an experiment. What I wanted to do, and first of all, I, I should mention that when I was an undergrad, I had professors encourage me to go into writing, even though I had no desire initially. I just, I didn't think I was good enough. I mean, this was, this was before blogs. This was before instant. Myth. I mean, this was in the very beginnings of the internet as a creative writing outlet. So I always thought that writing was limited as a career to very few people who were just much more talented and much more lucky than I would ever be in my lifetime. But as, my, as I mentioned, I had several professors, both in the United States and in Europe, who were encouraging me to write, and specifically to write um, historical fiction, because I was very passionate about history. I enjoyed it so much. I was devouring everything I could uh, on any assignment that I had. And I would actually be heavily dotting my assignments, my written assignments with footnotes. So I was showing my research and also appreciating essentially so many of the great tidbits from history that are nothing more than footnotes in history. So they were encouraging me to experiment with writing. And I started doing that around the time I was teaching for the very first time. I was in my mid twenties. I was teaching at Bucks County Community College, uh, some classes on Dante's Inferno and also on Renaissance art. And as an experiment, I tried getting the material that I was covering in class and writing it in a very comedic format online. And that became very popular, much more popular than I was expecting. And so what happened is um, I eventually met um, a very successful writer named Jonathan Mayberry at a book event. And he actually, um, he asked me if I had any ideas for future works for full novels. So I shared one, um, one idea with him that became my first novel, The Great Abraham Lincoln Pocket Watch Conspiracy. And he introduced me to an agent. She was a huge supporter of it, for which I'm incredibly grateful. And um, ultimately, I was able to have my very first book published in a way that I was told is freak luck. I had my first book published before it was written. I had my first novel published, even though it was not the first novel I had written. I had already written a full novel beforehand that I did not, I was told that uh, it would not be published first because the pocket watch conspiracy I was told was much more marketable. I was told it was evergreen. It's Abraham Lincoln is always popular. There's President's Day every year. So I was told that the timing worked very well for that book, which it did. I'm very glad that that was uh, printed when it was. So it was a whole lot of luck, but I will say it was luck that I was seeking out. I was going to book events. I was I, I wanted to learn from other writers and essentially learn their own experiences and there is one X factor that I forgot to mention as this was happening. And it was probably the most consequential occurrence in my life that led to me becoming a writer. Uh, in 2008, I worked for the Obama campaign. I was a field organizer in Pennsylvania and then an office manager. Well, after the election, um, I became uh, more friendly with some staffers. Uh, keep in mind, we were scattered all over the state. And in some cases, uh, even if we were in close proximity to each other like the same county, we would not see each other because we were so uh, completely engrossed in what we were doing. Uh, and is it engrossed or engrossed? I think it's engrossed. Sorry, that's me just being weird. But um, one one um, staffer that I was working with, she was an actress, and her father was a very successful filmmaker. His name is Ray Earl Fox. He's been nominated for the Academy Award for Best Short Film Live Action. And um, she introduced me to him in New York. And he was just getting started with a blog that he had put together where he was having fantastic writing on his experiences in entertainment and Hollywood. And he wanted my advice on it. And I wanted his advice as well, because I remember he lived at the time on, um, I think it was, uh, I think it was uh, Central Park West. I think it was 88 Central Park West. And he had the view of New York City, like his apartment he had this enormous, enormous window, like one or 200 feet long. And on the left side was Central Park North. On the right side was Central Park South. It was the view of New York that every immigrant, everybody in the city dreams of having. And I wanted to know how he accomplished that, how he was able to get that view. And we started talking on the telephone 
about once a week, uh, we would speak to each other between midnight and two or three a.m. And it was basically my that was my writing college. I mean, I would call him. In some cases, we would talk to each other more than once a week, and he would just tell me all these stories about writers that he knew. He was very good friends with Isaac Asimov, filmmakers that he had worked with, successes that he had, uh, failures that he had, just his entire life experience. And it was a wonderful, wonderful opportunity to learn from him. And I mean, just as recently as two days ago, I called him with a project. I called him at, I think it was 12.30. We spoke to each other until, um, I think, 1, uh, 115. And uh, just the fact that he was willing to open up his entire career and his entire life to me, uh, it was something that I have no doubt I would not have even started writing if it wasn't for that. So I usually call him the grandfather of Jacopo de la Quercia because uh, he's the writer who was a writer before I was a writer who I wouldn't be here without. So I'd probably say that was the most influential moment in my development as a writer. Well, and it sounds like, I mean, that relationship, uh, it, it spans kind of a gamut from, from influence to collaborative, which is um, maybe unique, but per, uh, almost certainly um, uh, covering a number of, like, of important bases for anyone who's trying to create anything. Mm-hmm. Uh, I want to talk a little bit about, about the art that you consume, uh, which is such a terrible word to use in regards to art. But what... Listen, I, I can tell you right now, the poet Dante, he described, he defined art as anything that's created by a person. So that's a stone wall. That's um, hours that you clocked in working. Uh, from his from his definition, as long as it was something created by humanity, according to the poet Dante, it was art. So you're in good company. <laughs> but what are you, uh, what are the things that you are currently... Uh, enjoying or taking inspiration from or that you find life affirming? Well, uh, one thing is I should definitely mention this because this is one thing that's really helping me um, during this current uh, lockdown that we're going through. I received many books from Princeton University Press for review and uh, fantastic hardbacks. And I review them, share them online. uh, Many cases, I've learned a lot about the university press system just reading some of these books. Um, the most recent book I'm reading right now is called uh, The Loud Minority, Why Protests Matter in American Democracy by Daniel Q. Uh, Gilliam, who's a professor at uh, political science at the University of Pennsylvania. A uh, fantastic book over there. And uh, they sent me quite a few others, um, several dozen others. I'm, I'm very lucky. Uh, Princeton University Press has been sending me fantastic books, which um, every one of them that I've read has been fantastic. I've reviewed all of them on Goodreads and on Twitter. Please check those out. And if possible, um, if anyone is watching this and is is interested in some of these books, uh, please arrange to purchase them through a local bookstore because they're the ones who need a lot of support right now. Helping your local bookstore will be helping every writer you've ever read, all your favorite writers, and all the best writers that haven't gotten started yet. So please do that. Uh, Something else is... um, I've actually taken a stab at painting for the first time since uh, middle school, actually. I'm quite excited about that. Um, there's a painting in the back that was uh, my fiance and I did. She got a, uh, my fiance and I got a little, um, an online, uh, uh, what was it? A, a painting night, you know, the kind you do at a restaurant where you're drinking wine and you're all following an artist. We did a painting in the style of Picasso and uh, she's a much more talented, um, fine artist than I am. And, um, I ended up doing a Picasso rendering of Abraham Lincoln. And because she's the wonderful woman that she is, and she's the big history nerd that she is, as am I, she turned her character into Mary Todd Lincoln, Abraham Lincoln's wife. So we have a portrait of the two of them together, in my opinion, watching um, Our American Cousin at Ford's Theater right before his assassination. So that was a lot of fun. I really enjoyed that. Uh, I would have to leave the room to see if I have permission to show that painting right now. I would love to, but I can't vouch for it um, because it's unfinished. And um, aside from that, I mean, like many Americans, I've um, been watching some some uh, my favorite films, catching up with some old classics, been listening to a lot of podcasts, you know, no differently than this one uh, that I'm recording for and yours. And uh, I've also 
as mentioned, um, I still have several projects that I've been working in, short stories, long stories. I've been developing those. And um, I have been doing a little bit of, I, I have been reading other writers. Some, some writers have been sharing their work with me for the review, which I've been very happy to offer. Um, some uh, other writers have been trying to help during this situation right now. So I've been exposing myself to their work and also exposing myself a little bit more to the writing industry than I did before to help some of these writers um, find some sort of income and almost just as important an outlet for their creative work during this time period. So I've been doing um, a whole bunch of that. And let me just think, um, in terms of other artwork that I've been, I mean, I guess Dante would consider this art. I've been doing a little bit more gardening. Uh, I'm very fortunate to be living in an area where it is sparsely populated. We do have a fenced in garden that uh, we finally started digging up and planting a little bit over there. It's a little bit of a sign of the, you know, the coming spring and hope springing eternal and all that. And uh, I guess I um, can't think of anything else off the top of my head. I've been ingesting artistically, but um, I mean, Andrew Carnegie in The Wealth of Nations, he wrote about how fortunate his generation is because when it came to some of the great masterpieces of artwork, works by Leonardo, Shimabue, Michelangelo, and what have you, he said that so many of those paintings were limited to only the wealthiest people in the entire world. In some cases, they only had like maybe one or two of them. He commented on the wealth that's accessible to anybody in New York City, if they simply go to a public library and they can get a book that has all those famous masterworks together at their fingertips. I mean, that was Andrew Carnegie in the 19th century talking about the wealth of information available to people. We have so much information available to us right now during this time period where we essentially need to be doing something indoors. So I highly recommend anybody who's listening to this take advantage of this time Go to openculture.org. They have over 1,500 free college courses on there, free entire courses. Go there, watch those videos, go back to school, study anything that you've wanted to learn about. Um, download Duolingo, learn a new language. I've been doing that right now. Um, I've been brushing up on my Italian, learning a little bit of Latin again. Um, again, just uh, if you've never reviewed books before, maybe try doing that. If you've never had a YouTube channel or something before, I never did. And I've started um, speaking to a very talented writer who has her own channel, and she's been helping me with the possibility of creating our own channel uh, individually and possibly together. And uh, just create, 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 create. It's, uh, I mean, every single time that you're interacting with an artwork, it's affecting the two of you. If you look at a painting, you could change the definition of that painting just by reacting to it because you're looking at it, you might pick up on something that no one has ever used about it before. Share that, comment on that YouTube video, share that one fascinating thing that you discovered about that movie or that novel or that poem. Just ingest all of this art that's at your fingertips right now, because I really mean this. I believe it was a lack of imagination and a lack of appreciation for the humanities and the civics and the sciences that have gotten us where we are right now. And if we don't learn from that mistake, if we don't have more of an appreciation for the arts and for the sciences, and also for our interaction with the natural world, we're just gonna be in the same situation that we are in right now. Only next time, it might be even worse. You know, it's interesting, uh, as we're coming to the close here, I, I take into asking the same question uh, of all my guests, which is, mm -hmm. you know, what the single biggest thing they they hope to to convey to other people is be it through their work uh -huh. or just through their personal life and and maybe this isn't your answer but it it feels like you just gave that right now oh, i'm honored <laughs> um it, it feels like uh at the very least if it's not if it's not the thing that is most important for you to convey i think what you just said is damn important um is there something else that uh, one thing is I there something say, else on that note that you would like to like to tell people? Uh, I would say that when it comes to the humanities, I think simply our individual humanity is very important right now in the sense that I have not seen my nieces in almost a month. I haven't seen so much of my family in so long. If um, I was supposed to be getting 
I was supposed to get married in April. My fiance and I had to postpone that. That is small potatoes compared to the life and death struggles so many people around the world are going through and have already suffered. Uh, fortunately, no one, I don't know anybody who has succumbed or who has died due to COVID-19, but I do have a student who had COVID-19 and it was actually one of my students from Albany Medical College. Uh, he was in Oxford. He contracted COVID-19 and he was a, a caregiver. He's um, He was a chaplain at the uh, the medical school over there. And he was at Oxford University uh, continuing his research. And um, I was able to speak to him and uh, being able to speak to someone who has gone through this and back is very edifying because then it's no longer a new story. It's now your friend's life. It's now what he went through or what she went through. And I would say that I really hope we use this opportunity to connect more with each other as humans you know, reach out to our family, spend a little bit more extra time talking to that one person, maybe building that bridge or rebuilding that bridge that had been destroyed for some other petty reason or for some serious reason. Because insulation, in my opinion, is not progress. I mean, it's necessary right now for what we're doing, because what we're doing is we're insulating ourselves from the disease that's out there. But we should not mentally insulate ourselves from the real world around us. There's already plenty of that going on. So many people living in their own bubbles, be it political, scientific, uh, racial, prejudicial, what have you. We need to communicate more with each other and we need to have the courage to admit when we're wrong. Sometimes the smartest thing anybody can say is, I don't know. It's that simple. Or that I was wrong about something. Or that this other person is right about this one thing. There is just this huge phobia in this country, in my opinion, or at the very least in our current government, that simply acknowledging a mistake is an admission of failure. Now, that's not true. That's a sign of progress. I'm not interested in fighting losing causes. I'm interested in the progress that actually leads to scientific discovery or artistic achievement or just progress in general. So I would really say that while we are insulated from our physical neighbors right now, do not turn that into mental insulation. We need to be more open with each other as a world when it comes to the sharing of information and an appreciation for facts in order to prevent situations like this from happening again. Because they are going to happen again. It's inevitable. There's no period in history where disease stopped. And there may never be an opportunity in the future for us to say the disease has been eradicated. It's just, uh, for right now, that's that's called science fiction. And I can't think of one science fiction book I've ever read where disease has completely been cured. We need to work together and pull all of our resources from all different fields of thought and research and understanding. Because right now, we are learning the hard way, the threads that connect every aspect of society, be it the toll booth operator, be it the firefighter, be it the caregiver, be it the volunteer teacher, be it the substitute teacher, be it the parent, be it the person stocking our shelves, every single person out there has always been a part of our society. And for whatever reasons, be it vanity, be it confusion, be it distraction, we've lacked a realization of the fact that we are part of a whole. And I really hope that if we do come out of this situation with enough hindsight to look at this year 2020 in order to better understand how to see the future, we need to understand that we need to work together. And that means, in my opinion, abandoning very, very destructive mythologies that we have been pacifying ourselves with for this entire century. I could not have possibly said anything better myself. Uh, thank you so much for joining us today. Again, that is Jacopo Della Quarta. Uh, please pick up his books. The Great Abraham Lincoln Pocket Watch Conspiracy and Mech Trump. Thank you so much again for joining us. Thank you very much for having me. It's been a pleasure. And again, thank you for everything that you're offering. Everyone, stay indoors, stay safe. How was that?